but uh, yeah, it was uh, it was great. So while you're in Malta, what kind of things were you doing? Uh, well, from Malta, about every third month, we would go across to Libya, North Africa. This this was in the days when King Idris had it, long before Gaddafi, and we used to do desert training. And we thought it was rough here, but once you got out there, you was in a bivouac tent. It was all right for me because I'm a little guy. But if you've got two six foot two guys in a tent with all their kit, you haven't got a lot of room. But we was out there for ten weeks at a time. You were limited to two pints of water a day. This is to wash and shave and drinking water. That was a cool water bottle that you as every soldier had. Um, I thought, well, this is a bit... And I managed to get escort to the driver that went down and picked the water up. In Taderna, we would be based in a place in Libya called Tahuna. And we used to go from Tahuna, 15 miles across the desert, till we hit the arterial road along the coast, down into Taderna, to pick the water up. And uh, we used to do that three times a day. First port of call when you brought the water back. Officers' mess, sergeants' mess, cookhouse, other ranks. If there was any water left, they got it. The last to get it, the only fusiliers. But uh, yeah, it was interesting. But we done Derna, two tours of Derna twice, ten weeks and six weeks, and then we went to Tripoli. But the most surprising thing to me, and you read it in the Bible, you heard of a place called Lectus Magna, Cyrene. It's the Roman ruins of Cyrene in the desert. And they said, any volunteers, anyone want to die out of Lectus Magna? Bang. About 30 of us stumped in the back of two, two, two five tonners. Absolutely marvellous. Everything, the fountains, that the Romans had built 2,000 years ago still worked. All the lead work. You used to get the Arab children come up to you. Here, Johnny, you want to buy these Roman coins? And I got to and gave them to my mum when I come back. Yeah. But it was a, a marvellous, got loads of photos at home. I should have brought them with me, but uh, yeah, it's uh, quite an amazing. And it's quite true, people talk about the desert, that you can hear a sound and you think it might be half a mile away. It could be as much as five miles, eight miles away. And once the sun goes down, it goes down very quick, not like here, because it comes up quick. And it goes, believe it, I wouldn't have believed it if someone told me that under the water trucks at night where the taps were dripping, they would freeze. It would be 100 degrees, 95, 100 degrees in the daytime. And at night, you get ice on the water under the trucks. And I was on guard one night, walking around. And I could hear this splashing under this truck. And I looked, there was a great big toad. I mean, God knows where this thing had come from. It was a great big toad, because me, I always like frogs, toads, and loose and things. I picked it up and looked at it, very similar to Ram. But I thought, how strange, you know. But it is amazing. The desert has, has got a charm of its own. People that have been to the desert all. I liked it. I've always wanted to go back to Libya, but because of the conditions with Gaddafi, um, we had four lads killed out there that have been buried in Benghazi Cemetery. This is peacetime. You know, two of them turned a truck over and took their heads off. Uh, two of them drowned swimming. Went down there for a re recreation day, day. Went swimming down there, anyone that wanted to go swimming. But they didn't realise how strong the current was and they were swimming. They got dragged out of sea and drowned and found them the next day. 
but uh, yeah it's um, it was a big eye opener and cost the food you you would get it um, if you could call it that um, for a short period of time maybe 10 days for breakfast we were given um, pilchards in tomato sauce cold breakfast You're looking at each other and two big slices of thick bread dinner time would come what did you get? pilchards in tomato and this went on for days and days and everyone was getting a real one we found out later that it had been an order from the war royce had come down see how far you can push them in typical one um, logic you know see how far they will go till they rebel there was a rumour in the regiment at the time because you had the four rifle companies set out 20 miles apart I was in their quarter company which was 250 strong the, reg, uh, the battalion at that time was 900 odd strong it was the biggest time that they had that sort of amount of men all together in one place uh, one of these rifle companies the old sweats battalion as we call it these are guys that have served Korea um, Suez They had a poor new young uh, second lieutenant that was in charge of them and he marched them across the desert and to a man they all sat down and said we're not going any further until we get a decent meal. It was never recognised as such. You weren't supposed to know about it. But word drifted down and we got to hear about it because we all laughed. We was all in the same boat. We was a bit better off than the rifle companies. But uh, yeah, it was a great, 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 great level. <laughs> so um, when you finished your national service, did you continue in the army and become a regular soldier? Yes, I I done three and a half years territorial with a few of uh, and then like young guys. Most young guys that reach a certain age, they meet up with a young lady and they get married. And that's what happened to me. And I tried to get a council place because there was no way I could afford to buy a property. And I moved up to the Suffolk Norfolk border, a little village called Brandon. And then I found out there was a territorial army unit there of the Royal Anglians. Um, and I joined them and I was with them for about three and a half, four years. And it was, it was good. And I was always chosen because I'd done national service like a regular soldier. Uh, there was only two of us out of about 35 that had done service before and the sergeant always looked to me um, to help with the recruits and to show them how brain guns were stripped, how SLRs were stripped, put back together certain things you'd done once she was out in the field um, field craft and yeah it was good and I always loved the life that as a soldier, ex-soldier, but I've always kept in touch with the regiment and I suppose it must be 20 odd years now that I've been coming up the town on a regular basis, maybe half a dozen times a year. We go to France four or five times a year. Monte Cassino every year. Used to, with um, uh, well, Michael Gibson Oryx the name, you know the name, and uh, he always used to pick, not always, but at certain times, he would ask me to be reef carrier for him, to go out, stand, salute, and the reef to him, then he would take it and lay the reef, and 
I have done it for uh, the Ulster Division when we was out in France. Um, well, not hockey, he was, he, was the, he was the guy. I was very flair to him. The top Protestant guy, I can't remember his name at the moment. But yeah, it, uh, I've always enjoyed it. And I don't think service life does any harm to any young guy. And I think it makes him more respectful of his own personal hygiene and appearance. I mean, if I had a daughter and she brought on some toe rag that I didn't approve of, <laughs> I, I would, you know, maybe I shouldn't. But uh, I think it's a shame. I, I think that a lot of youngsters today need a lot of more help than what they get. All the boys' clubs that I knew in Bermondsey, around the Elephant and Castle, Wolf, all over, East End of London, they've all been closed down because they want to build more houses. Well, where are the youngsters going to go and play? As a boy, I could play cricket in the road because no one had cars. But every street's full of cars now, so you can't play cricket. Girls used to play oops, alley gobs, and things like that. But uh, I think. It, but a lot of modern life is very hard for youngsters and there should be more government help pointing them in the right direction. I think school is too easy. You must have discipline at school. Same as parents. It's up to parents. My father wouldn't let me and my brother lay in bed beyond 7 o'clock Sunday morning. Up, breakfast, up and out. You know, right up, and I've always maintained it. Quite often, um, I've always been a clean motorcyclist, and I still ride, I've still got three motorcycles. I'm 73 now, and my brother says, You're silly old fool, what a bad time you're doing it in. But I can get up mornings like this, nice and bright, up past four, up past five. Nice, nothing on the road, quiet, the birds are singing, go out, jump on the bike and have a slow ride out in the country. Stop when I like, cup of tea in the fair. It does the wrong. I enjoy it. But you know, people say, What do you want to get up? My son says to me, What do you want to get up that time? I said, Well, what's the point of laying in bed just doing nothing? You know? <laughs> anyway. I think we're coughing now a little bit. <laughs> and you could bash away. Um, um, so if it hadn't been for national service, do you, would you have considered like joining the territorial army? Or like I, I had thought of joining the army because I knew that I was going to have to do it and I thought, well, shit. Both my grandparents uh, I've been army people. My mother's father, uh, Wilson, her, her, her maiden name was Wilson. He was a Scotsman come down from Glasgow. And he was such a small man like myself that they wouldn't take him in the First World War because of his size. But he wanted to go because he didn't want to be stigmatised as a trench dodger and he wrote the Kitchener and somewhere in the family there's a letter still exists that he got a reply back from Kitchener that since he had such a good knowledge of horses they accepted him. He finished up with Lawrence of Arabia out in the desert. Um, he was twice mentioned in dispatches because he, he, he was given these dispatches and he got cut off. He was travelling over the desert and he got captured by Tuaregs. But he does quite a remarkable thing, the dispatches. He put up his backside and the Tuaregs left him to die in the desert. But a, patrol found him and took him back to the British lines 
and so he was a very lucky man. But uh, he got mentioned in dispatches, oak cleaving clusters, as you know, um, twice. On my father's side, as you can tell by my name, it's Italian. And he was in England, he came to England when he was 12, because his father was so strict that his mother sent him to England with her sister and he was brought up by his aunt. Um, when the First World War broke out, he applied and joined the Italian army that was fighting on the British French side at the time. And he became an Alpini. He was an officer in the Alpine Corps. Um, he was fighting the Austrians in the Alps and he got frostbite and everything and I, recently I've been trying to obtain his medals from the Italian government because I know that he did have quite a few medals to come so I can hand them on to my son you know, to keep, but uh, yeah from that side of it my own father when the Second World War came about um, Dad joined the King's Royal Rifle Corps. Because as a child, I always wondered why he walked so fast. And I had to run to keep up with him, as you know, all rifle regiments gallop along. And uh, when I was thinking about joining prior to national service, I thought, I'd like to go in my dad's regiment, be a rifleman, you know. But it wasn't to be. When you go up on, uh, for your national service, interview. You see an Army, Navy and Air Force. Oh, what would you like to join? I said, I want to join the Army. What do you want to be? You know, and of course the other two, the Navy, and they, oh, you, you don't want nothing to do with them. They're all poo-pooing the idea, are they? Because they want to keep their numbers up. Um, but no, uh, the, the Army officer who was there, he said, well, what would you really like to go in? At the time, I thought, well, if I can't get into the KRR, I don't want to be in the infantry. I want to go in the tanks, World Tank Corps. I was pleased I did, because they're the first ones to get knocked out. <laughs> <laughs> so I finished up Royal Fusiliers, and because once you join the regiment, you learn the history of the regiment then. And what an history they have got, the Royal Fusiliers. It's a shame that they're losing their 2nd Battalion. My old battalion was the 3rd Battalion, which really was the original Royal Regiment of Fusiliers, as long as well as the Royal Scots Fusiliers. They were the only two Fusilier regiments in existence in 1685. It wasn't, although uh, the Northumberlands were well, number five of the line. They were never Fusiliers up until quite a later date. The same as with the Warwicks, which were number six. The Warwicks would have gone out of existence when Montgomery knew he was head of staff at the War Office and they knew they was going to be disbanded. You make them Fusiliers and put them into the Fusilier Brigade and that is how they survived. Well, that's the lot that's going now. So, it'll only be the Northumberlands that will be representative of the Royal Regiment of Fusiliers, which is sad. Mm. I think that all county regiments, that's what made the British Army unique. There was great rivalry with all regiments, corps, whatever, and it was a good thing.